raised in Denver, Colorado, and enlisted in the U.S. Navy after high school in 1979. He was selected as a staff instructor at and stayed at A1W Prototype until 1980, and as a second class petty officer trained approximately 12 classes of nuclear power officers and enlisted personnel. During the height of the Cold War, Captain Macbeth EM-1 was assigned as the Electrical Division Leading Petty Officer aboard a fast attack submarine, the USS Scamp, in New London, Connecticut, where he qualified submarines and nuclear engineering watch supervisor. After his first Navy career, Ensign Macbeth attended an undergraduate medical school at the University of Colorado through a Navy scholarship, after which he was assigned to Naval Medical Center San Diego as a general surgery intern. In 1991, Lieutenant Macbeth was selected for Naval Flight Surgeon Training in Pensacola, Florida, and assigned to Squadron BT-6, flying helicopters and earning the qualification to, to solo in the Navy t 34 c After flight school, Lieutenant Macbeth was assigned to Carrier Air Group Staff, Carrier Air Wing 2, and served aboard aircraft carriers USS Ranger and USS Constellation, with various deployments to South America, Central America, the Indian Ocean, and Africa. Lieutenant Commander Macbeth trained as an anesthesiologist at Navy Medical Center San Diego and continued as a staff cardiac and pain anesthesiologist from 1997 to 2000. In 2000, Commander Macbeth transitioned to the Naval Reserve and underwent fellowship training in pain medicine at the University of California, San Diego. As a Naval Reserve anesthesiologist and pain medicine physician, Commander Macbeth served in Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 with the Marines at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and is currently attached to OHSU San Diego. Captain Macbeth served as OIC for Detachment Foxtrot in 2008 to 2010 and continues to be part of Det F as a senior medical officer. Captain Macbeth continues to practice medicine at Naval Medical Center San Diego for the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine, providing care for active duty military, dependents, and retirees, as well as educating hospital corpsmen, Navy residents, and pain medicine fellows. Captain Macbeth is married to his wife of 40 years, Susan, and is the proud father of their two children, Greg and Christine. Captain Macbeth continues to work as a staff anesthesiologist at Kaiser Permanente, enjoys traveling with his wife, and hiking and fishing in the Eastern Sierras. Welcome, Captain Macbeth. Thank you. has been flown aboard the USS Constitution, commissioned in 1794, a wooden-hulled, three-masted heavy frigate of the United States Navy. It does not hurt, for I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of my country. And when it is by those I have served in battle with, it hurts. When I fly and have mass to honor my soldiers, my airmen, my sailors, my marines, and when I lie in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the graveside of her fallen son or daughter, I am proud, my name is Old Glory. Long may I wave, dear God, long may I wave. warm welcome to his wife Susan, his children Greg and Christine, his extended family Fallon, Faye, and Homi, and his guest speakers Commander John Western, United States Retired, Master Chief Richard Wedge, United States Retired Navy, and Mr. Morton Block. From the desk of George W. Bush, 43rd President of the United States of America, September 21st, 2017. Captain Michael D. Macbeth, United States Navy. Dear Michael, 
Congratulations on your retirement from the United States Armed Forces. I'm proud to have served as your Commander in Chief and I'm pleased to join you family, friends and colleagues in recognizing your career and accomplishments. Throughout history, the dedicated men and women of our military have protected our citizens and preserved the ideals that make our country strong. Their courage and sacrifice have inspired countless people and have helped shape America's character. On behalf of a grateful nation, I thank you for your contributions to our security and to the cause of peace and freedom. Commander Yeko will now present Captain Macbeth with his shadow box. We keep hearing some recurring themes about honor, courage, commitment, dedication, and he truly exemplifies all of those things. He's a remarkable individual. He's dedicated a huge part of his life to serving our country and defending us in the U.S. Navy. And if you watch the news at all, you know we need a strong Navy. Submarines, aircraft carriers, hospitals, and clinics. He performed to his fullest and is finishing an impressive 36 years of naval service. Navy pride! Bravo Zulu, as we say. Him and I have a lot in common. We both were here three years ago when I retired. <laughs> and I wasn't sure I was going to fit back in this uniform again, but I did because of his inspiration. We both joined the Navy in the early 70s, 1976 for him and 1974 for me after we both got out of high school. We both love flying airplanes. We like fishing. We like health care. What is not to like about any of those things? He was the commanding officer of the unit when I arrived. And he has a unique leadership style that most Navy leaders do not have. He knew every member of the unit by name. He recognized these individuals. And at the end of his tour, he presented each of these leaders with the memento of their service with him as the commanding officer. A great leader inspires. And that is what he did for many of us. Leading by example, from fitness to nutrition, healthy lifestyle, and leadership traits that are positive, not negative. He would challenge us before the physical fitness test that if you could beat him, he'd buy you a six pack of your choice. I don't know if he ever had to buy one for anybody because he was always first. A couple. Oh, a couple did. <laughs> a father, a husband, a naval officer, a physician, and a friend that I value greatly. I hate to say it, but it's almost like reading an obituary. <laughs> but he's not dead. He's going to go on to his next chapter of life. So he's changing course. We use these navigation Navy terms a lot. He's going from the Navy division to the civilian division, as we call the Civ Div, if you're familiar with those Navy terms. It's a big transition, and there will be an empty spot that you'll need to fill. I went on to become a Lieutenant Colonel in the Civil Air Patrol and do search and rescue, so I can still put on a uniform. There's a lot of sacrifice with being in the Navy Reserve. They rely on us for 30% of their needs whenever there's any kind of an operation. I don't care if it's at sea, in the air, or in Afghanistan. A third of that force are reservists. And I want to talk about the sacrifices for a minute. Susan, Christine, and Greg, nice to see you. You truly are the backbone 
career as well because he could not have done it without you and I salute you three today. Thank you for your service. Captain Michael Macbeth, thank you for your service. It's really great to be here today. Career as an enlisted man qualified in submarines and achieving the rank of captain in the medical corps. What an accomplishment. I was fortunate enough to meet Captain Macbeth, Dr. Macbeth, at Kaiser when I needed some pain relief for my back. During the first appointment, he asked me what my background was. I told him I'd been a submarine electrician. He didn't tell me at that time that he had been. Maybe he thought I wouldn't have faith in him or something. <laughs> but after the procedure, he told me that we had something in common, that he'd been a submarine electrician before going to medical school. I thought, what a wise decision it was by those who recognized his potential and gave him the chance to prove that they were right. What a valuable asset to the Navy. Even though he's always very busy improving the quality of life for those he treats, we usually had a little time after the procedures to talk about the Navy and submarines. I really enjoyed that time. Give me a chance to talk about it. I often think, what kept me in the Navy? After getting out and re-enlisting, I know it wasn't a living condition on the old ships and diesel submarines. I enjoyed my Navy life on, and time on the waterfront. I have many fond memories, especially submarine duty. I would do it all over again. I hope you Navy people here have the same enjoyable experience I had. And always remember, hard work has many rewards. The proof is right here. Captain McBeth, I wish you the best and continued success. Live life to the fullest, I know you will. Enjoy every day and have more many, excuse me, I'm getting dry. Many more exciting adventures with your family. I enjoyed hearing about them during, during your procedures. Make every day count. Thank you for your service to our great country and thank your family for supporting you. Before I read my speech, I'd just like to say that uh, I have a very unique relationship with Dr. Macbeth. Uh, he's been, I've, I've been a patient of his for 20 years and a good friend, I hope. Uh, kind of a relationship we have is uh, I recently had a procedure and as I always do, I ask him if it's the first time he's doing this. <laughs> And uh, the last time he answered me, he said, don't worry about it, Mort, because I was up all night re on the internet and I got it all set. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here today to pay tribute to Captain David Macbeth's retirement. I am a 92-year-old World War II Navy veteran. I served at Normandy and in the Pacific at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Having been in both theaters of war makes me extremely proud. I was stationed aboard an amphibious gunboat at Normandy, which was very heavily armed to protect the forces landing on the beaches of Utah. Following this mission, I was ordered stateside, then transferred to the West Coast for duty in the Pacific Theater. In January of 1945, I reported to Honolulu and assigned to the USS Talladega Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank my wife of 40 years. Uh, I can offer no higher compliment than describing her as a great Navy wife. She's wise, patient, intuitive, intelligent, and incre incredibly organized, and occasionally flexible. <laughs> she just gets things done. This retirement and ceremony were two of those things, so thank you so much. Thank you to my children. They have been part of the Navy their entire life. 
and I know some of it has rubbed up, rubbed off on them, and I'm proud of that and of them. Thank you to family and friends who traveled long or short distances to share this day with us. Dr. Danaher. I would like to thank HM1, HM1 Acero for coordinate, coordinating this event and the ceremony. I couldn't have done it without his leadership. And again, HM1s are the ones that get it done. I'd like to thank Lieutenant JG Tejada for assuming the role of Master of Ceremonies. It's not an easy task keeping us on track, on time. Uh, as you probably don't know, Ensign Sturk was going to be the Master of so Ceremonies as of yesterday. And in old Navy fashion, there's a, a Argentinian submarine that went down a couple of days ago and hasn't been heard from. Well, Ensign Sturk is on the Deep uh, Submergence Rescue Unit over on North Island. So it's very ironic that uh, my Master of Ceremonies gets pulled to go look for a submarine after being in the United States Navy and coming into the submarines. I thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe the universe is telling me something. I would like to thank my guest speakers for sh sharing their time and their stories with us. I'd also like to thank Commander Yakel, the officers, Chief Salinas, and the crew of OHSU Det Foxtrot for their participation in this evolution. Thank you, Chaplain, for your words of hope. Thank you, MU1, for the Navy Band, and Mr. Kelly for the beautiful music. BM, uh, Bosun's Mate Membrano, where are you? Can't have a retirement without a Bosun's Mate. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the Midway, uh, Carol. They've done a great job of organizing this and making sure that it was very, uh, it wasn't as painful as it could have been. So thank you, John, Bob. So how does one distill 36 years of anything into a few minutes, uh, and let alone a career spanning nine presidents, 12 chiefs of naval operations, from post-war Vietnam to cyber warfare? Do I talk about my achievements or adversities? Do I talk about, uh, do I discuss deployments or duty stations? List highlights and lowlights. They may be of interest, but in my opinion, boiling my Navy career down to its essence is best described by those people who shaped, enhanced, and needed it along the way. Sure, I had to create the goals and plot the course, but as I look back, the right people, the right time, and at the right place molded my career and made me more than I could have ever imagined. The first person that comes to mind was my boot camp company commander. He was called Chief. That's all I ever knew him by, and it just so happens he was a bosun mate chief. Red chevrons and five service stripes and all. If you don't know what that means, talk to the bosun. Bosun mate chiefs are as genuine Navy as they come. Most start out as deckhands and learn seamanship from the very bottom up. They care for the ship, paint it, polish it, and repair it. The red stripes indicate that he had, had some disciplinary pa uh, action in the past, so he definitely wasn't a saint. But few sailors are. As you heard in my bio, I joined the Navy right out of high school because I had no other place to go. No college, no real job, and no one lived at home back then. And there was a poster on the wall in my high school that said Navy Nuclear Power Program. I thought that might be interesting. So that kind of sparked my interest. I tested into the Nuclear Power Program and the Navy recruiter made me feel smart and special. It might have been the, I, I might have been the first one that he had ever signed up. <laughs> he enlisted me as an E3 soon to make Petty Officer after graduation. So during the first week of boot camp, I kind of cruised right under the radar 
feeling pretty smug, knowing what I was going to get after I was finished. But that was until the boatswain mate found out. He found out that I was a nuke. And I came to find out that he didn't really have the same high opinion of me that the recruiter did. And the chief, the boatswain's chief, took issue to my accelerated promotion schedule. Why would he care? Well, typically when you enlist in the military, in the Navy, it takes you a couple of years to get what I was going to get in about nine weeks. So you can see why he had issue with it. From that point on, I think his goal was to orient me <laughs> adequately, compressing the remaining time and training in boot camp, making my experience much more tangible. He did this by extending my working parties, I stayed in the scullery a couple of extra weeks, I was in the mess hall a couple of extra weeks, and those are pretty long hours. The e EMI, if you don't know what that is, talk to me later. The EMI on the grinder, in the midsummer Illinois sun, the late nights, the fairly early morning PT, and even, and even cleaning the head with a brush. And I, as I remember, it was a pretty small brush. But one evening, there, with the graduation nearing, the BMC sat us down and shared his thoughts with the company. He talked about the Navy and the duty about responsibility and success. In his words, the bosun's words, he said, I can't appreciate being at the top of the ladder unless you climb it, rung by rung. You don't skip them. No shortcuts, no skating by. Be careful who you step on climbing up the ladder because you may, you'll may you probably end up coming down the same way. And the only way off the ladder is down. So don't stay at the same, don't stay at the same ladder, move to the next. It might be higher or harder, but that's what makes you better. Good words to live by. The second was a, lieutenant, a young Lieutenant JG probably right out of college, teaching nuclear engineering to a bunch of hotshot E4s and E5s. It was our first day of nuke school, and the class LPO had just handed out books, workbooks, and slide rules as part of the standard issue. And if you don't know what a slide rule is, <laughs> it's basically a mechanical calculator. The JG was walking around the room in his summer whites describing the curriculum, the Q2 week testing, and the sacrifices that would be required to graduate. Studying every night, every weekend, holidays. And that was an exce exceptional expectation because we were living in Orlando, Florida. He then walked down the aisles and collected about half of the class's slide rules, including mine, and put them in a box. He indicated that those E4s and E5s who didn't have a slide rule probably wouldn't need them because they wouldn't put in the effort, they would wash out, and they would head off to the fleet, but not as a nuke. I was shocked. Did this guy know me? Was it that obvious I was going to fail? I had never been challenged like that before, with expectations or dedication. I decided at that moment to set my expectations and dedication higher, and higher than those around me, and I would not fail. I still got my slide rule. <laughs> the third was Chief Richard Burris, ICC SS, United States Navy. I was a second class, 20 years old, right out of nuke school, reporting to A1W Prototype, Idaho, ready to learn how to operate a nuclear power plant. Chief Burris was the department head for training. He is qualified as Nuclear Engineering Officer of the Watch, which is pretty hard to achieve as, a, as an enlisted man. And he commanded a presence in maneuvering that one couldn't explain. He was the guy. Any reactor safety inspections, any new plant modifications, any trials, it was him that stood that senior watch, just in case something went wrong. He knew everything about that reactor, everything about that plant, and most of all, he knew everybody and everything, everything about them. 
in maneuvering and, and around the, the prototype. Since he was that guy, I decided early on that I would get most of my qualifications, most of my qual signatures from him, especially the plant procedure quals. So the process was that you would pick a qualification, you'd study it, you'd go talk to the staff instructor, he'd ask you a bunch of questions, you wouldn't know all of them, you'd go, take, you'd go look, look them up, you'd come back, they'd sign off your qualifications and you'd move to the next one. Just like submarine qualifications, right Master Chief? But not with Chief Burris. You'd go, you'd study probably more than you would normally study. You'd go, at, he'd ask you a couple of questions that you, it weren't even in the textbook. You'd go look them up somewhere, somehow. We didn't have internet back then. And you'd come back and talk to him a little bit more. He'd ask you a few more questions that you didn't know. You walk away, come back few more questions. It took about two to three times longer to get a qualification signature from him than any other staff. But after 20 to 30 signatures, I got pretty good at anticipating and answering his questions. And the process led more to a mentoring relationship, teaching and talking and training. So when it came time for my oral board qualification, I did pretty well and I was asked to stay on as a staff instructor to teach nuclear power plant operations to officers enlisted for the next two years. When I found out I had been selected to stay and teach, I went to thank Chief Burris for his help and mentorship. He listened, nodded his head and then said, you don't have to thank me because this is my job. This is what chiefs do. We make, sailors, we make sailors achieve more than they ever think they would or could. So you're welcome. Have a nice day. And by the way, you're going submarines in two years. Apparently the chief had still handi was still handing out qualifications to me. The fourth was a cob. And you're honored, Master Chief. When I reported aboard the USS Scamp SSN 588 fast attack, initially in Virginia and then New London, we were heading to New London out of the yards. He was, he was only known as Cobb, and I think they're only, on, only known as Cobb, but they're the most senior chief on the boat. He was a salty master chief who wouldn't have passed the BCA or the body fat standards. And he probably wouldn't have passed the physical readiness test either. But we didn't have those back then. He did make a good Buddha baby for the crossing of the equator ceremony. <laughs> and, he, and if you want graphic details of what that means, you can talk to me later. He was a man of few words, but he, when, he, when he talked, everyone listened, including the skipper. As the leading first E Division LPO, he called me into the goat locker for lunch, which was an honor. And typically, the, the chief's mess food is outstanding. But it was intimidating. At the end of the meal, he looked at me and recommended, recommended that I start acting like a chief if I wanted to be one. I hadn't thought about it much. I was still a pretty junior first class. I didn't know quite what he meant. But I had the chance to learn about what he meant a few, a few weeks later. We were finishing sea trials coming out of the yards on a shakedown cruise, making sure that everything was working appropriately before we took that submarine operational. We were cruising off the coast at depth, and when over the ship's loudspeaker came, fire, 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 amidships. And the mess deck emptied almost instantaneously because a fire on board a submarine is a real emergency. I was first to arrive at the scene with an OBA, which is a self-contained oxygen breathing apparatus used to fight fires in small compartments. The EDIF chief and the Cobb arrived shortly thereafter and then the fire party. It was probably an electrical fire and as I remember it was a motor generator because that was pretty much all that was in that compartment. I checked the door and it wasn't hot, but I knew what was in there. 
the ventilation was secured and typically in, uh, insulation and oil would continue to burn filling up that compartment with smoke. There weren't any lights, it was pretty dark. No way to see unless there were battle lanterns that were lit inside. I looked around at everybody else trying to figure who was going to go in because I was the leading first. It wasn't going to be me. But the cob checked my OBA, handed me the fire extinguisher, and cracked the door. In I went. I fumbled my way to the motor generator, still smoldering, flipped the breaker just in case, and spent the entire extinguisher at it. Eventually the smoke stopped, the smoke stopped and I came out with an empty extinguisher. I handed it to the cob. Leadership training had begun. The fifth was Lieutenant Commander Matt Maxwell, Medical Corps, United States Navy. It was the end of my first 16 hour day as a surgical intern assigned to the vascular service, sitting off the fourth floor of Med Surg, Naval Medical Center, San Diego. Having received the sign out from the other, ready, uh, the other interns ready for my first overnight call, could have been up to 24 hours, because we didn't have, Christine, we didn't have limits on our hours back then. Matt was the chief uh, surgical resident for the vascular service, and we had just finished lightning rounds, generating a long list of tasks to be completed overnight. After talking to a couple of nurses, Matt started to walk off the floor in typical Maxwell fashion. He later became a cardiothoracic surgeon. He stopped, turned around, and looked at me, and in a pretty loud voice said, hey, Macbeth, don't kill anyone. <laughs> These patients are your responsibility, and he turned to walk away. That was the beginning of my medical career, and from that point I, I knew what it was to be a physician. Uh, the sixth was Captain Don Brown, United States Navy. Captain Brown was an A6 naval flight officer, he was a bombardier. He sat on the, in the uh, right seat of an uh, of airplane like that. And I was, as a flight surgeon, had just reported he was my air wing commander aboard the USS Ranger. He was soft spoken, he loved to read, he loved to tell crew stories because I think he'd been on about 20 of them. And he loved to fly and he loved naval aviation. We had eight squadrons, and then uh, he and, him and I flew in all of them as much as we could. I was telling uh, John here that I think I've flown on about 80% of the airplanes on this flight deck because of CAG Brown. He was an A6 Bubba at heart, and unless someone screwed up, he was an A6 Bubba at heart, unless somebody screwed up, and then all hell would break loose, and you'd never see it coming. So one example of that is. I was in uh, the right back seat of that e of an EA-6 over there and we were flying along doing low levels out on the Gulf and the pilot was kind of maverick-like. And so after we finished the flight we were coming back and we go into the break which we fly over the carrier to land and as we went into the break the pilot got distracted which is something you don't like to do traveling at 600 knots. And we ended up traveling, flying through about 200 feet above sea level before he figured it out and pulled us out of it. We landed appropriately, but when the CAG heard about this, he called him into his stateroom and pretty much dressed him down. He, he grounded him for a week. He, uh, he was stuck in quarters, which meant that his, uh, the rest of his squadron had to pick up the slack. And I remember him yelling through the bulkhead, you almost killed my flight surgeon. <laughs> so at the beginning of our Westpac, Kay called us in, me, the staff, and the rest of the squadron COs, and laid out specific expectations for each. The first was that we would return from deployment with all the assets that we started with. I mean, we weren't going to lose anybody, and we weren't going to lose any aircraft. The second was, expectation was the health and the welfare of the air wing 
was everybody's responsibility. Emphasizing ultimately it was his responsibility. And he wanted to know everything, anything and everything that could affect the safety of the ship or the air crew. And he wanted to know anything and everything that could affect or compromise our mission. So while we didn't have an aviation mishap, partway through our cruise while importing uh, Yokosuka, we lost a pilot to a very high visibility alcohol-related incident. It had something to do with this pilot breaking into an admiral's uh, house. At admiral's mast, after a lot of yelling, the admiral started to blame the squadron CO, his wardroom, and medical, which was me, a lonely lieutenant, for the embarrassing situation, not knowing, not anticipating. That's when the CAG stepped in and assumed full responsibility, citing his lack of leadership by not setting the appropriate expectations to the air wing, which he had. Knowing full well that that would be the end of the CAG's career. You don't promote after participating in the Admiral's mast. The Admiral dismissed us at that point and the incident was closed and never discussed again. The CAG accepted the responsibility in the way a true bona fide leader would. And I learned leadership wasn't about being perfect or politically correct. It's about doing the right thing in the most difficult situation, no matter what the cost. The last, and by far, the most influential person in my life and in my naval career is sitting in the front row. Without her, I sincerely doubt I would be standing here today. <laughs> Susan helped me bear the loneliness of boot camp, A school, nuke school, keeping me focused with her letters. She actually wrote letters of love and encouragement. She left her family and her friends to spend many nights, weekends, and holidays alone, with the exception of that crazy fly, as a newlywed, to be with a sailor in Idaho, me 90 miles away, in the middle of a desert, unable to comfort her loneliness or even kill that fly. But she was always there, picking me up at the bus stop, all hours of the day or night, always with a smile, and always with a kiss. Great sacrifice. She supported my lifelong desire to become a physician. She wanting to be a mom, staying at home, raising our children, but she couldn't, having to work to help me put help put me through college and medical school. I will never be able to understand or appreciate how much courage she mustered for those eight years. But I will, I will spend the rest of my life trying to make it up to her. She supported me flying off carriers, practicing jungle medicine in Panama, surgical internship, anesthesia residency, and a pain fellowship. She endured a, an entire pregnancy alone. She endured moves from coast to coast to coast to coast to coast. She endured lead months, especially during my recall. She juggled budgets, all the while making sure the family unit was on solid ground. Finally, she listened for many years, I think with one ear, about the complaints concerning busy drill weekends, PRTs, GMTs, NROs, ATs, and all the other acronyms that consume our reserve life. And as I said, without her, I would not be here. Susan did not marry a captain or a physician. 
She married an imperfect sailor who was a better person because of her. And for that, I am forever grateful. United States Navy family, retired, departing. Ha, 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 ha.